Hi, everyone. So it's about that time we are going to get started. Thank you for joining us for our second presentation of the day. <laughs> this is the first, second of many webinars today. And if you would like to join us next Saturday, our, we will have more presentations um, and registration for that will be available shortly. My name is Shayla Gutierrez, Garden Program Coordinator at Green Venture. And I'm joined by Julia, our youth volunteer who will be monitoring the chat. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All participants are on listen only mode. Mic is turned off just to ensure the quality of sound of our recording today and to make sure that we have good sound for today's se session. We are recording today's session and it will be available for you at a later date. Throughout the session, we encourage you to use the chat box for any questions to be answered at the end of the presentation. And if for some reason technology is against us today, we will be right back as you will be put into a waiting room. If you are joining us for multiple presentations today, as a reminder, you will need to log on to the individual Zoom link that was sent out in the reminder emails. Today, we are joined by Jason Allen. Jason Allen is the host of the Environmental Urbanist radio show, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. on 93.3 CFMU and online at cfmu.ca. Each week, he interviews scientists, artists, policymakers, and activists about the impact cities are having and can have on our changing climate. Jason has a particular focus on urban biodiversity and the role urban areas can play in protecting species that are threatened by habitat loss as the natural areas around us shrink. Jason is also the author of the Environmental Urbanist Newsletter, where once a month he does a deep dive into topic about cities and climate change. You can learn more at www.environmentalurbanist.ca. I'm going to stop my screen share now, and then Jason, you can go ahead and perfect. Your screen. Let's do this. Let's do this. Share. And we should be off the races. We're good? Sure, good. Thank you, Sheila. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sheila, for that welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me. We have a pretty packed house. So I'm pretty excited about that. We're going to talk today about gardening for the birds, how to get our feathered friends to visit and frequent your garden. So let's see that click over. Not advancing manually. We're good. All right. So, who am I? Thank you for that intro, Sheila. I'm the environmental urbanist. I host a radio show. And something you should know about my radio show is that every February is gardening month, where I bring in a bunch of people who are, frankly, better gardeners than I am uh, to talk about uh, biodiversity in gardens, to talk about native plants, and to talk about lots of different ways of attracting different things to your garden. And one of the topics we talk about a lot is attracting birds to your garden. So, we're going to talk about that today. Um, my caveat for this whole presentation is at the bottom there, I-A-N-A-E stands for I am not an ecologist. So if you're looking for uh, scientific names of the various plants that I'm going to talk about today, if you're looking for detailed information about planting and about habitats, I'm sorry, I don't have it. But um, uh, I'm more of a science educator and a science communicator. So you're going to get uh, some good stories and hopefully some good information in the 30 minutes or so we have about how to organize your garden for birds. All right, so let's... Uh, Let's get going. So to start with, why birds? Uh, one of my favorite reasons we don't often think about is pest control. Um, so in my neighborhood west of downtown, there's a pretty bad tick problem. Uh, and there's also annual infestations of vine borer beetles and cucumber beetles and all sorts of nasty creatures. Uh, and the birds that come into my yard twice a day and kind of scatter over the yard and uh, pick through the, the grass do a great job of controlling those pests. So that's a huge win for us in terms of, uh, in terms of managing the, the bad things in our garden. In terms of general biodiversity in your garden, birds are a great advantage. So not only do they control bad pests, uh, they fertilize, uh, they, uh, they add a little life to your garden, and they add uh, overall uh, elements to the the whole diverse range of, of creatures and species that are living in your garden. That's generally a good thing. In terms of entertainment, they're low cost and high reward. Um, if you, uh, it doesn't cost much to throw a feeder up. Um, it doesn't cost a lot of money to do some of the plantings I'm talking about today. 
but the reward can be tremendous. Uh, I think of birds as nonstop entertainment in every genre. If you like romance movies, then you've got, uh, then you've got birds pairing off and, and making babies and, and, and raising their family. If you like action adventure, you've got chickadees fighting over your feeder. If you like, uh, broad physical humor and comedy you just have to attract dark eyed junkos frankly those guys are hilarious so I don't know what it is i just find them really funny so lots of entertainment generally birds are awesome to have around in your yard so that's my uh, that's my plug for why birds are great also want to briefly talk about in praise of what what a lot of people think of as boring birds so um this is a robin you've seen a million of these things you see them every spring some people get excited about them in the spring and by the fall they're like oh boy another robin um these are great birds they're beautiful they have a gorgeous song um they're uh, the announced spring coming they're a great great creature to have in your in your yard and uh we often overlook how beautiful everyday birds can be uh, if you're one of those folks who's really into the challenge of identifying birds you can't beat the variety of sparrows that are going to come to your feeder. I have no idea what all the different sparrows are. I've lumped them all into one category. I call SBCBs or small brown chirpy birds. Um, I have no idea what they are. So, but if you're into identification, that's great. They often have gorgeous songs. Uh, song sparrows have absolutely beautiful songs. They can be reliable visitors. And I've said a few times, it can be fun and frankly, hilarious to watch. So that's my praise of boring birds. So then let's talk about what birds need and what birds want. And so we're going to talk a bit about bird psychology. When I first got into fly fishing about 20 years ago, everybody was talking about trying to outsmart the fish. Uh, and so we're going to try and get inside a bird's head and figure out what they're looking for in order to get them to come to your yard. And birds, broadly speaking, care about three things. They care about finding food. They care about not becoming someone else's food. And they care about making more birds, which we often define broadly as the three Fs which are food, fear, and frolicking. So that's what birds are looking for. They're looking for a good source of reliable food, which can be a feeder, but there's lots of other things that they're looking for in terms of the diversity of their diet. Uh, and they're looking for a way to get protection from predators. They're looking for a way not to become a snack. They're looking for a safe place to hide and raise their young. They're also looking for protection from the elements uh, and for, for keeping out of the wind and the rain. And finally, birds are looking to raise their young. They got nests, they, uh, they want to make babies, and they want to raise their young safely and have a good food supply close by to the young. And we're going to talk about that in a second. And if you're planting and thinking about what you can put in your yard that fulfills two or more of these needs, then generally you're planting something that's going to attract birds and it's going to do a good job of getting those birds into your yard. Okay, so what I've kind of grouped those three areas into, if you want to think about it, what I call the three C's of planting for birds, and those are cover, caterpillars, and clean water. So when we talk about cover, we talk about dense shrubs, we talk about uh, coniferous trees, we talk about things that will provide good shelter, pardon me, from the elements and good hiding from predators, so that when birds go in there, they can keep out of the wind, they can keep out of the rain, and they can hide their nests and, and keep safe from not just overhead predators, but uh, but sort of ground-based predators as well. Raccoons, squirrels love to eat eggs, um, house cats, lots of things can predate on birds. So, and they're well aware of it. We used to have a merlin that lived a few blocks away from us. It would do a regular patrol over the neighborhood. And uh, whenever it came by, all the birds in the yard would go suddenly quiet and silent and disappear. And then once the Merlin flew overhead, they'd all come out again. So they knew when this thing was coming uh, and were, were prepared for it. And they would all disappear into the my neighbor's three massive cedar trees is where they would hide. Let's talk caterpillars for a second, because this is something that's really, really important about attracting birds that a lot of people don't really get. The most important thing about caterpillars is baby birds can't eat seeds. They can't. They can't digest them. They can't crack them. They can't do any of those things. So... Uh, a, a bird family looking to raise baby birds is not going to be looking for the bird feeder in your yard. That doesn't help them at all. They're looking for something soft and squishy and something very, very high in protein and nutrients. And that means caterpillars. When you look at the nutritional and the energy value of a, of a, a type of bird food, there is nothing in a bird's diet that's more effective for them to eat than caterpillars. And when I talk caterpillars, I'm talking an awful lot of caterpillars. So I've seen a couple studies now, one in the States and one in the UK, where they set up a camera next to a uh, bird's nest to see how many caterpillars mama bird was bringing home on a daily basis to feed the three or four young in her nest um, and range between 3,500 and 4,200 caterpillars a day. So over 4,000 caterpillars a day. And if you look at the sort of eight to 14 days and most birds stay in the nest before they fledge, you could be looking at 50, 60,000 caterpillars easy. So when you're planting trees, you need to be thinking about caterpillars and, and, and berries as much as you're thinking about seeds. 
And then finally, we're going to talk a bit about clean water at the very end. Uh, it's really, really important, but it's very, very simple. So we won't spend a ton of time on the clean water issue. So to start with trees, shrubs, and flowers, I have a bit of bad news in that the vast majority of what you can plant to attract birds is a tree or a shrub. There actually aren't that many flowers that do a good job of, of attracting birds. Most of it is trees and shrubs. So when you're planting those things, you should be asking yourself a few questions. One, does it provide cover? Two, does it provide food like seeds or berries? Uh, three, is it a home for caterpillars? So is it food for birds and their young? Uh, and the one we often don't think about, but it's also important is, does it provide materials for nests? And that gets into like the, the flowers and the ornamental grasses as well. So these are three things you often want to think about when you are putting things into your garden and getting ready to plant and attract birds. So start with trees. For cover, you can't beat coniferous trees. Uh, you can't, generally, your best bet for cover, I'd say overall, is the east for white cedar. Uh, it's native to, to Ontario. It's dense. It's can be carved into a shrub, it can turn into a tall tree, it can do lots of different things. My neighbor next door has three very large cedars up against her back deck, and it is a home for an enormous quantity of birds in the spring and summer and all winter. Um, provides phenomenal cover, it's very dense. We even had, we had a cedar next door on the other side at one point uh, until the developers tore it out, that was actually a home for bats. So they, they house an enormous diversity of species and um, do a great job of providing that cover. Eastern white cedar will attract robins, cedar waxwings, a number of other birds, not so much for caterpillars. These, these trees and shrubs don't do a great job of supporting caterpillars, uh, but they do do a great job of providing cover and seeds, frankly, for the birds to eat down the road. Uh, similar as Eastern white pines, uh, you, Eastern white pines can be pretty big and kind of scraggly. Uh, we have a columnar white pine, which is small and, and quite dense and it's quite lovely. Uh, that's, that's a great home for smaller birds. Um, chickadees and robins love those uh, and those, White pies do a good job of attracting those. Um, maybe look for a smaller, more compact version because a white pie can get very, very tall and very kind of spindly. So if you're looking for, for something that's a little more manageable, um, the fastigato or the, or the more the columnar versions are good. And also balsam firs um, will attract a variety of birds, pine siskins and nuthatches and a few other things. Um, there aren't a lot of pine trees that are native to Ontario, but uh, firs are. are uh, and so these are a great option for it. And again, the, the pine cones are often a great great source of food for birds as well. Let's talk more about caterpillars and berries then. So let's talk about trees and shrubs that, that are good for, for, for food for uh, mature birds and for their young. So first up is the flowering dogwood, um, native to Southern Ontario, attracts some great, great species, cardinals, woodpeckers. Uh, and we had a lovely uh, yellow warbler that was living in ours when it went to Barry last year. So they produce gorgeous uh, white flowers in the spring and these really lovely uh, sort of orangey red berries in the fall, in the late summer and early fall. Uh, and it's it's a bird fiesta. Birds uh, will come from all over to, to snack on it. And the benefit of having a food source that birds associate with your yard is a good place to go is that birds are then gonna hang around there to see what else pops up, to see if there's other food sources or they're gonna live nearby to see other food sources that are gonna benefit them and other resources that they can use. So if you do a good job of attracting birds with, a, with one particularly good food source uh, or resource for them, uh, that can encourage them to stay around and just maybe stay at your feeder for, for most of the winter. That can be a benefit too. Service berries out west where I grew up, we call them Saskatoon berries. Uh, they can be a shrub or a tree. They're lovely either way. They attract some pretty flashy birds. They can attract orioles and waxwings. Uh, I know I know I spoke earlier in praise of boring birds. Uh, but orioles and waxwings are pretty exciting to have uh, around your yard and, um, and they're pretty cool. Uh, woodpeckers can, can, can do them too, can live on them too. Uh, they produce, as you can see here, a froth of gorgeous white flowers in the spring. And then again, late summer, early fall, they produce these amazing little berries. Uh, if you can before the birds do, they make fantastic jam. But um, if you're leaving them for the birds, you don't have to worry about them falling on the ground and making a big mess for the most part, because the birds are going to get almost all of them. Uh, birds are very excited when these show up and uh, will do a very good job of cleaning off your tree pretty quickly. Talking about caterpillars versus berries, uh, there's two trees in particular I want to highlight. The first is the white oak. So depending on the estimates you read and where you go, white oaks can support anywhere from 400 to 900 plus different species of caterpillars. Not all at once, because that'd be kind of weird and kind of gross, but, uh, but generally oaks can produce and can support an enormous number of caterpillars. They can be a little intimidating to grow because they're big. Um, 
I don't know if you know uh, Studio Tropos on Instagram and Leisha McCricky, who's a landscape architect in town. She's doing a project on monument trees here in the city where she's trying to track all of the, the biggest and oldest trees. Uh, and so far, almost all of the three, 400 year plus trees she's found have been white oaks. Uh, they live a long time and they get quite big, but um, they're not big to start. You generally, they don't do very well starting from uh, transplants. They don't transplant very well at all. They've got a big taproot. So often you're better off growing them from acorns if you can find one. Uh, and um, they will grow 10 to 15 feet in the first 12 years. So they will do a good job of, of growing fairly quickly. And you'll have a reasonably nice tree in not too long. And if, if you're new to gardening and you think 10 to 15 years, 12 years sounds like a really long period of time. Uh, once you get used to the sort of the annual cycle of how gardening works and how things often happen on a yearly basis, then uh, 10, 12 years isn't really very long at all before you have quite a lovely tree. Um, that said, don't plant them under power lines or communication lines or the uh, the folks who are in charge of those things will come ho come along and make an unholy topiary out of them trying to protect their, their cables. So uh, uh, just manage that accordingly. But white oaks are really the gold standard for attracting caterpillars. So much so that Doug Tallamy, whom we're going to refer to as a resource later on in this in this session, uh, wrote an entire book just on white oaks. They're, they're, that, they're that beneficial for biodiversity. Uh, sugar maples are also not quite as good as oaks, but uh, sugar maples, red maples, and silver maples, which are all native to southern Ontario, uh, also do a great job of attracting birds, uh, support 300 plus species of caterpillars. Uh, tenators and warblers are some of the more exciting birds you'll draw with a, with a silver or sugar maple. Um, woodpeckers love them because they have slightly softer bark. and It's easier to get at the grubs underneath and um they they're beautiful they're gorgeous they're a very iconic tree and you could do a lot worse than having a sugar maple in your yard i'm going to skip one i'm going to choke cherries uh woodpeckers tend to love these uh they are um and a lot of and uh vireos vireos are great um very pretty birds and rth is not raise the hammer it's ruby throated hummingbird so um hummingbirds also love choke cherries because they have sort of a, a tubular red flower and they produce a huge bunch of of um really sour, sour red berries in the fall. But uh, we don't like them so much. People, for the most part, don't like them, although some people pour a ton of sugar into them and make jam. But um, for the most part, choke cherries are great for attracting birds in the fall. Now, if you want to talk your biggest bang for your, for your tree and shrub planting buck, uh, in terms of reward, in terms of number of species of birds, in terms of how actively birds will, will come to your yard and in, uh, versus the cost and effort, you cannot beat the common elderberry. And if you don't have a ton of space and want to just get a quick hit of a shrub that's going to do a ton of good for attracting birds to your yard, elderberry is my first choice. So our elderberry is how we got all the house finches in our backyard. Uh, Phoebes and Towies are also uh, attracted to it. Uh, produces gorgeous flowers in the spring, uh, lovely flowers that, that are really great for native pollinators and for bees uh, and solitary bees and those sort of things. They love it. And so you're attracting that biodiversity to your yard. Uh, and then in the fall, they produce this huge mass of berries that uh, attracts birds from all over and uh, quite a, a wide range of birds will come to your yard to feast on these berries. If you're hoping to catch a couple of them and make them into cold syrup, you got to move quickly because uh, the birds will make very short work of them. Also, uh, because they're a fairly dense shrub, they can be up to 10 feet wide and sort of 10 to 12 feet tall. But uh, because they're a fairly dense shrub, they also provide that cover element uh, for birds looking to hide or shelter out of the elements or to hide from predators. Uh, elderberries can be super great for that. So um, they do like a bit more sun than we did provide last time. We had ours under a, a our neighbor's fairly big tree and it really, really struggled. But uh, once the developer cut that tree down, um, we um, there was a lot of sunlight in that section of our backyard and our elderberry has just thrived. So, uh, so you want a little sunlight for your common elderberry. Okay. Uh, up next, talk a bit about non-native trees. So I wanna talk a bit about my Norway maple that I have in my yard. Um, as you probably know, Norway maples are not native to Southern Ontario. And so when we moved into our place about a dozen years ago, there was a Norway maple there. It had been beaten up pretty badly. It had been lollipopped pretty awfully and was struggling to come back. Uh, we've nurtured it and fed it and watered it and treated it really well. And now it's a pretty robust tree. But I'd say in the last dozen or so years we've lived there, we've had maybe three, four bird nests at all. Uh, birds just, I mean, they sit in there to, to munch on the cicadas and use it to get to our feeders. But for the most part, birds don't really care about it. And I went and did some digging as to why. And it's because Norway maples support about a half dozen species of caterpillars. So like five, six, maybe 10 tops. Caterpillars just don't care for Norway maples. And so as a result, birds don't care to make their home there. So 
Think of a bird setting up a nest as kind of like a young couple shopping for real estate in a buyer's market. I know we don't have buyer's markets anymore, but if they were, um, they're looking for uh, a safe neighborhood, so cover, uh, and they're looking for, one of the amenities they're going to look for is a grocery store nearby. Uh, and if they have to drive half an hour to a grocery store, then that's not as attractive as somewhere where you can walk 10 minutes to a grocery store. So a Norway maple is, the, is that half an hour drive tree that where you're going to have to go a long ways to get the, remember, 50 to 60,000 caterpillars you're going to need to feed your young over the course of a week and a half. So Norway maples aren't a great option. So if you have one in your yard, please don't cut it down. We need our canopy desperately in this city. Uh, our urban canopy is nowhere near where we need it to be. So don't cut it down. But if you're thinking about planting, <clears throat> this would be near the bottom of my list. At the absolute bottom of my list of what to plant in order to attract birds is the lovely ginkgo tree, the ginkgo biloba. Um, it's not native, it's from China. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful tree. It has gorgeous leaves. It has incredible color in the fall. It does not support a single species of caterpillar. None, zero, not a sausage. So birds completely ignore this tree and won't go anywhere near it. So there's no reason for them to, except for the occasional shelter from the elements. So if you have a ginkgo in your yard, please don't cut it down. We need the tree canopy, but, uh, uh, but don't go planting a ginkgo thinking it's going to get you birds because that's not going to happen. So let's talk about flowers and what they can do for your bird. So the the three birds you're almost always going to attract with any seed bearing flower is goldfinches, chickadees, and nuthatches. I love chickadees. I think they're fantastic. They're, they wake up every morning and choose violence. They're very aggressive birds for their size. You don't really, don't really think of them being like that, but uh, if you see a bunch of chickadees going at it over resource, it's, uh, it's pretty intense. Uh, goldfinches, American goldfinches are beautiful with their black and yellow coloring and, uh, they will come every fall to sink, take whatever seeds you've got. And nuthatches are just hilarious. They, they crawl in the trees upside down. They make this really funny kind of burp noise all the time. And they're just super great birds. So if you're planting flowers to attract, uh, to attract birds, generally you're going to attract goldfinches, chickadees, and nuthatches. Sunflowers. I've got a native sunflower here, uh, the Canadensis version. But um, I'm going to cheat and say that even if you're planting non-native sunflowers, the, the, the big sort of fancy ones with the big heads and the big the turn towards the sun, those are going to also attract a whole variety of seed loving birds. And those are going to do a good job at that. As are black eyed Susans, they're going to attract a whole bunch of sun birds and black eyed Susans are generally native. Uh, they're a great option, but I want to talk for a second about cone flowers and what they have to offer. So cone flowers will attract a bunch of different birds. Um, but for two reasons, one is they eat the seeds, that little cone that you see at the top, that sort of that cone in there at the top is seeds. But also if you leave them until the next spring, when they pull that seed out, there's a thistly, there's sort of a downy part underneath the bottom of that seed. And uh, they will use that to line the nests. So we're going to talk a bit about garden cleanup in a sec, but uh, but that's a, one important thing to remember about uh, a multi-purpose flower being echinacea or cone flowers. I'm doing a whole slide just on ruby-throated hummingbirds. Why? Because they're a super big thrill to see in your yard. Uh, we have a trumpet creeper vine in our yard at the front that is attempting to eat our chain link fence. And... Um, as a result, we get ruby-throated hummingbirds almost every year into our garden. They come into the back garden and patrol the nasturtiums, and they are fantastic. But uh, if you have space to grow a trumpet creeper, they're big vines. They take up a lot of space. Uh, they're native, so I can't call them invasive, but they're really aggressive. Uh, but um, if you have space to grow one, note the shape of the long conical red flower. That's what ruby-throated hummingbirds are into. You see there with the bee bomb as well, long conical red flower. Hummingbirds also love those. And finally, the red columbine, which is the native columbine, um, long conical red flowers. That's what hummingbirds are into. Uh, and if you plant those, generally you'll, you'll be able to attract a few of them. We're well into the hummingbirds range. It shouldn't be too big a challenge to get them to come to your yard. Uh, but, um, but these are some of the flowers that you can plant to encourage them to show up, all right? Um, so that's the plants. Let's talk a bit about clean water. Generally, you're gonna wanna have a source of clean water in your backyard. That means a bird bath. If you can get a fountain version of a bird bath, that's ideal because it circulates the water and keeps it a little fresher. Um, it's not always possible. We have a little sort of a small sort of filter we uh, fountain. We got the solar fountain that rests inside a bird bath. It's going to spray around and that's great. Uh, that works too. Um, that's ideal. Heated water in the winter is great if you can do it. Uh, we don't have a heated water source in the winter, but we go out every morning um, and provide fresh water. We bring in the ice cube and let it melt in the sink and then put out uh, fresh water, warm water, not hot, warm water for the birds for the day. And they get their, uh, they get their daily, uh, daily hydration. 
Beware of starling attacks. Starlings will move into a bird bath and dominate it for a few minutes and splash the water everywhere and make a huge mess. Uh, there's not a lot you can do about it. That's just kind of the way starlings are. Uh, just some general themes to close with here. Just got a couple more slides to go and then we'll turn it open for some questions. Uh, anything that encourages bugs, worms, or caterpillars generally encourages birds. So keep that in the back of your mind. If you're encouraging native pollinators, you're encouraging birds. Uh, garden cleanup, be thinking about birds. Uh, that whole notion that we should wait until 10 degrees Celsius to clean up uh, our, our, our fall garden in the spring is not entirely accurate. There are a lot of larvae that don't even wake up until 12 or 13 Celsius. A lot of larvae that wake up at seven or eight degrees Celsius. So it's, that's sort of a, a, sort of a happy midpoint. Uh, but if you have any ability to take your stems and even if you're cutting them out of the ground, put them over somewhere else in your yard and not cart them away. Um, that's going to allow those larvae to, to catch up and to, and to grow. Quickly, Christmas trees, if you don't donate it to the RBG and you have space in your yard, throw it in the backyard and uh, let the birds use that for shelter for the rest of the winter. And then in the spring, you can chop it up and do as you like with it. And then finally, don't forget that grass and other soft materials like that, great nest material. So again, if you're not, if you're open to leaving your grass to over, your, your long ornamental grass to overwinter in the spring, those often make great nesting materials. Uh, a couple of things about bird behavior. Birds tend to be most active in the mornings. They tend to eat and drink and then get on with their day. In really bad weather, they will disappear and then they'll come back in droves when the weather turns nice. And then I wanna talk quickly about feeders, specifically about this poor little guy here. Um, clean your feeders regularly, uh, at least once a month, if not more often. Uh, house finch eye disease is all, it's moving into Southern Ontario. It's made a strong showing in, in upstate New York and it's now in Southern Ontario. If you see a finch at your feeder, it looks like this. It has that set of nasty eye going on, is losing feathers on his head. Take your feeder indoors, soak it in a bleach solution and do not put it back outside for another two weeks. And that's really what they recommend to stop the spread of house finch eye disease. Squirrels, we've just made our peace with squirrels. We feed the squirrels too. Um, and I'm not going to wade into the cat debate because we're running really low on time if I'm going to open it up for questions. So some resources for you to take a look at. Exploringbirds.com is a fantastic website that shows you not only a whole bunch of different birds you can attract to your feeder, but talks about all the plants and trees that attract them. Uh, and then for those trees and species, it gives you uh, their native range. So which provinces and, and states they're native to. So that's super helpful. Uh, both OntarioWildflowers.com and OntarioTrees.com are great resources for... Um, native plants and for understanding what trees are in Ontario. Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy, available at the library. It's a great resource. And again, uh, if you want to tune into my show uh, anytime this month, Tuesdays at 1 p.m., 93.3 FM uh, or cfmu.ca, uh, it's gardening month. So hopefully you'll hear some more good stuff there. And I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't mention greenventure.ca slash tree kits. Uh, they're giving, some, giving away some kits or selling kits, I can't remember which, to allow you to grow native trees from seed. So great resource there. Sorry, I only have a few minutes left for questions. Um, yeah. Go for it. Uh, and as a reminder, we will be providing a follow-up email with the resources that Jason has highlighted in his slides here. Um, Jason, wonderful talk. Uh, I recently attended Doug Tallamy's um, Tending to Nature series, and oh, no. um, it was really amazing, um, the information he provided. 90% um, rearing with insects is... 90% of, of birds uh, rear with insects and mm -hmm. caterpillars is that dominant source. So um, it's really pertinent that when we plant, we should be thinking about those host plant spe spe specializations, right? So mm -hmm. we do have a few questions in the, in the chat. So the first being, will a cut leaf elderberry attract the birds? A cut leaf elderberry. Um... Generally, in any any elderberry that produces berries is going to attract the birds. So it, I, I don't know cut leaf specifically. I all the one main ones I know are the common and the red uh, elderberry in southern Ontario. Uh, but if you have an uh, elderberry that produces berries, that generally should do a good job of attracting birds. Yeah, and somebody did ask about the the name of the native sunflowers, and I did pop those in the chat. There, there are two you. different native sunflowers. So um, we're going to move to the next question. Could we encourage the city of Hamilton to pick up the trees in April? Hmm. To which, sorry? Um, could we encourage the city of Hamilton to pick up the trees in April? I, I'm not sure what. Oh, the Christmas, the, the Christmas trees. Christmas trees. Yeah, um, that would be lovely. Um, I don't see how you do that, <laughs> but uh, we can certainly encourage them to do lots of things. But, uh, but yeah, that would be a, a lovely, uh, lovely change if they picked up the trees in April. That'd be lovely. But uh, we tend to chop ours down and I 
I carve spoons out of them and I sometimes burn them when I go camping. That's really what I do with them. Yeah. So, um, so is there any more questions in the chat? Um, I don't see any more questions. So um, cool. we're going to go ahead and close it up if there isn't any more questions. Looks like there is one more. Um, it's been minus 30 here for the past few nights. How on earth do the birds survive the extreme cold? Their blood is made out of antifreeze. It's kind of hard to describe, <laughs> but uh, they have uh, a circulatory system that somehow manages to um, not not free solid. I don't know how they do it. Uh, they, but they, as you'll see, it's a very, very different group of birds you see right here uh, than you see... Um, during the summer and a lot of the birds that live here during the summer could not survive this weather but dark-eyed juncos for instance i talk about them a lot they're my one of my favorite birds they have come down from the arctic <laughs> that's where they spend their summers so they, they love the cold and they thrive in it so uh different birds have just managed to adapt yeah and now now is a good time do you think to to go out there and and spot for birds since there isn't any of that green cover right yeah, it's fantastic. And especially but the, part of the reason the birds make their homes so much in my yard is because uh, of my neighbor's cedar trees. Uh, and we have a small pine tree and uh, that's been great. But uh, don't underestimate the power of a good feeder uh, in the winter because because uh, it can attract quite a nice variety of birds. We even have house finches right now. It's great. Yeah. So besides your backyard, Jason, is there any other um, recommendations for people or spaces, public spaces that people can go to to um, check out for birds? Um, yeah, so if you live in Hilton, uh, which I assume most people do, uh, Coots Paradise is, uh, and uh, Princess Point is an, is an absolute haven for migratory birds in the spring and the fall. Uh, an enormous number of species go through there, not just waterfowl, but songbirds. It's, it's a, you walk through there uh, at sunrise during the spring and summer. It's a riot of songbirds. You'll, you'll rarely see a greater variety than that in Southern Ontario. It's fantastic. Wonderful. And one last question. What type of feeder do you need to get birds to share? Share. Um, that's a great question. I don't really think birds are really into sharing. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have a platform feeder, so it's a, it's a flat sort of red plastic tray uh, that, that has a lot of space for multiple birds, and we find the birds are pretty good about sharing space there. If you have a feeder that has a, a small hole in it or like a limited resource for the seed, um, birds will fight over that. That said, the drawback of our platform feeder is it's a squirrel buffet. Uh, and the squirrels will often jump on it and tip it over and spill the seeds all over the ground. We've just kind of made our peace with the squirrels. I'd rather them eat the seed than dig up our tulip bulbs. So we just kind of made our peace with them. But uh, there's, there's trade-offs for every kind of, kind of feeder you get. Wonderful. So with that said, um, our next presentation is planting, choosing a fruit tree for your needs in your backyard with uh, Silver Creek Nursery. Uh, thank you, Jason, so much for your wonderful presentation. And thank you all for tuning in to Jason's presentations. Um, together, we really can make a difference when we're thinking about um, how we interact with our environment. Um, be sure to check out the full list of speakers for next Saturday as well. The registration will be open to that. And as I mentioned, we will follow up with an email with links um, that Jason has provided. So um, there is still time to register for more presentations later on today. With that said, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the presentations today. Thank you so Thanks, much, everyone. Jason. Bye-bye.